Acme Animation Factory, and as you might guess from the title, this is a Mario Paint style game compatible with the SNES mouse. It allows you to edit pre-made sprite animations and place them in different scenes, and you can compose your own music as well. As far as Mario Paint clones go, this one is pretty good. Obviously, it's completely outdated by today's standards, but if you have a small child, this one along with Mario Paint might be entertaining for them. Animaniacs isn't Looney Tunes, but it is a Warner Brothers game, and a Warner Sister game, so I'm including it anyway. This one's developed by Konami, and it's kinda weird. You wander around a world map visiting various sound stages on the Warner Brothers studio, each representing a parody of a film genre, so yeah, the actual show is represented well here, and the game gets the sense of humor down well enough. As for the actual gameplay, it's odd. You only really have a dash attack, and there's no health bar, or even lives. You play as the three main characters, trying to recover 24 pages of a script while a avoiding enemies sent by Pinky and the Brain. Yeah, they're here too. You can throw various items you find lying around, there's some interesting platforming elements here and there, and the level design allows you to be inventive with certain stuff as you can see. And there's also this slot machine that activates every 5 coins you collect, but all it really does is either add to your coin total or take them away, and every 100 coins you get an extra continue. While there's some cool level design here, this game is just okay, there's better on this list. Next is Bugs Bunny Rabbit Rampage. I remember renting this one as a kid and having fun with it, so I might be a bit biased here. If nothing else, this is a great idea for a game, with Bugs being trapped in a world and tormented by an anonymous cartoon animator. The presentation here is fantastic, revisiting all sorts of old Bugs Bunny cartoons throughout 10 levels and seeing familiar characters like Marvin the Martian, that gigantic angry wrestler, and even Toro the Bull. In other words, it's like Mickey Mania, but with Bugs Bunny cartoons. The only thing with this game is the actual platforming. The Bugs sprite is pretty big and unusually lanky compared to most other platformer sprites, and it can take a while to get a good feel for how he jumps and controls. But the game is fair and gives you plenty of opportunities to get used to things, and there's an incentive to do so thanks to all the level design and the inventive premise behind the game. I wouldn't call Bugs Bunny Rabbit Rampage as good as anything like the Capcom Disney games, but it's still pretty good. Next we have Daffy Duck the Marvin Missions, based on the series of Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century cartoons, with Daffy as Duck Dodgers, Porky Pig as his assistant, and Marvin Martian as the villain. Again, this is a side-scrolling platformer, although with a bit more of an action slant this time, with Daffy being able to use five different guns across 20 levels, a freeze gun, an electric gun, a spread gun, a grenade launcher, and an anti-matter gun. And you collect money throughout each stage to pay for ammunition. You also have a jetpack to zip around each stage, and in addition to that, a shield, and this is one of those games where when you see an enemy, you put that shield up as soon as you can, wait for them to attack, and then shoot them. Otherwise, it's not likely you'll last long in this game, and that's kind of a bummer. The main problem, however, is the controls. They're extremely slippery and not easy to get used to. Also, it takes a ton of hits to destroy even insignificant enemies, let alone bosses. This game is okay. It's kind of a run-and-gun style where you can fly, so that's kind of cool, but if you want a game like that, you're better off with something like Sparkster or Skyblazer. Believe it or not, of all the games in this video, the best might be Looney Tunes B-Ball. It's pretty much the Looney Tunes equivalent of an NBA Jam game, so there's no fouls, tons of ridiculous dunks, and a lot of fun, silly stuff. You collect these gems on the court so you can later buy power-ups you can use during the game, like hitting your opponent in the face with a pie to create a turnover. How do you not love that? There's plenty of familiar characters you can play as, they're all animated well, and it's four-player compatible. Plus, there's tons of weird stuff like the ball turning into a dog when there's a shot clock violation. I wish I had more to say here, but it's really that simple. Looney Tunes B-Ball is a lot of fun and one of the best basketball games on the Super Nintendo. It's a good time. For a change of pace, we have Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday, with the goal of the game being to guide Porky through his nightmares, which take place in a hellish snowy landscape, underwater ruins, and a desert where it's literally raining cats and dogs. Again, like Rabbit Rampage and Looney Tunes B-Ball, this is such a great idea for a game that I wish they did more with it, but the game itself is pretty good. This is one of those platformers with much more of an emphasis on jumping and dodging. You do have a projectile attack, but your priority here should be to dodge enemies first, since they can appear from nowhere. The game controls well. This has tighter controls than the other platformers in this video, and the music fits the game well, and the visuals are of course fantastic. This one's a little on the easy side, but it's worth checking out. Chalk Up Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally is kind of a missed opportunity. Like most other games on this list, it captures the visual style of the cartoon almost perfectly, and the goal of the game is to have Roadrunner just outrun the coyote and avoid getting caught, and he'll use explosives and even this comical Batman outfit to try and catch him. Roadrunner has kind of a turbo meter that can be replenished by eating bird seed. The problem though is that with a game predicated on speed, you gotta have intuitive level design to complement your character's abilities, and it's just not here. Sonic 2, this is not. Combine that with some 
sloppy hit detection, and this is a frustrating one to play. Unfortunately, I'd have to say avoid this one. Interestingly, this game also received a sequel titled Wild E's Revenge, where you control Wild E Coyote and try and catch the Roadrunner, but it was never finished or released since the developer Sunsoft went bankrupt in 1995. There is a ROM available though, so you can at least play through the first level if you'd like. It should be noted though that if you get even within a few pixels of the Roadrunner, he sprints away, so that's unfortunate. According to an interview on SNES Central with the producer of the game, the goal was to collect parts to set up an elaborate trap to catch the Roadrunner. But I mean, what's the point if you can never catch him? This game seemed doomed from the start. Sticking with unfinished, unreleased games, there's also Sylvester and Tweety, another game that got cancelled thanks to Sunsoft declaring bankruptcy. This is a ROM available to play, but unfortunately there's really not much here. You play the game as Sylvester, you wander around Granny's house, and uh, yeah. Interestingly, there was another game in development from a completely different company titled Tweety and Sylvester, and that game was also cancelled. Weird. Speedy Gonzales Los Gatos Bandidos is another side-scrolling platformer and another game featuring a very fast character, but thankfully this game doesn't have Speedy flailing out of control like in the Roadrunner games. This one's a little more controlled and the level design is much better suited for your character's skill set. Speedy's friends are all partying it up until Sylvester and his buds come and kidnap them, so it's up to Speedy to rescue them. And there's usually a handful of mice placed in each stage to rescue, and they double as checkpoints as well. Speedy Gonzales can kick and occasionally pick up stuff if necessary, but this is pretty much a pure platformer. This is another game that's just okay. It's definitely not bad, but you're not really missing anything if you haven't played it. Some people like to compare this one to the first Sonic game, but this is nowhere near as interesting as that one. Having said that though, it's a perfectly okay game. Next there's Tasmania. In this game, the player takes a viewpoint behind Taz as he runs and dodges stuff, so this plays like a racing game. A very boring racing game. You just have to beat the time limit and eat some birds as you go. I don't even know what else to say here, there's just not much going on. I guess this could be a fun speedrun game for some people, otherwise I'd avoid this one. Tiny Toon Adventures Buster Bust Loose is another Konami game, and it's a game I've talked about a ton on this channel over the years. It's a great looking game that captures the look of the show perfectly. The music is familiar and well done, and the main gameplay mechanic is something a little different with a sprint meter that's used to climb walls. There's varying objectives throughout the six levels, like feeding Dizzy Devil in this boss fight here, and there's some inventive level design here as well. I'd put this one on par with the Disney Capcom games in that it's short and not particularly challenging, but it's still a fun playthrough today, and it's still a cheap cartridge. I'd put this one right alongside stuff like Aladdin and Mickey's Magical Quest. The Tiny Toon series got a second game titled Wacky Sports Challenge, also made by Konami, and this one is a surprise. It's a series of seven mini games where you pick from four different characters from the show to compete in events like a test of strength, a top-down obstacle course, bungee jumping, stuff like that. The best part being that it's four-player compatible, making it easily one of the most accessible four-player games the SNES has to offer. What I like about these games is that they're not just mashing buttons, they're predicated on some kind of skill or timing, so each game is actually somewhat interesting. So yeah, if you're looking for a good four-player game, or even just a multiplayer game to play with your kids, Tiny Toon Adventure's Wacky Sports Challenge is a great choice. Magical Quest starring Mickey Mouse made by Capcom. This is a game that starts out slowly. It seems pretty bland in the first level, just another paint-by-numbers platformer, but the game gets better and better the further you progress, as Mickey unlocks different outfits that enable certain powers like projectiles, a grappling hook, and a fire hose, among other things. The level design also complements these abilities very well. Mickey's Magical Quest may be rather short and bare bones, but it's still a fun playthrough today. There's two sequels to that game, the first being The Great Circus Mystery starring Mickey and Minnie, and as the title suggests, this game is two-player co-op, and that's really the only major difference from the first game. It's still six levels, and there's still four outfits you unlock and switch between as you play. This time around, it's stuff like a vacuum cleaner and a hobby horse with a toy gun. The graphics and sprite animation are a bit better, and the settings are a bit livelier as well, so if you liked the first game, you're sure to like this one too, especially if you're looking for a decent co-op platformer. However, you might be even better off with the third game in the series, which was only released for the Super Famicom and never left Japan. It's Mickey to Donald Magical Adventure 3. Again, this is more of the same kind of stuff, but there's minor changes to the level layout here and there that allows for a bit more exploration, including bonus rooms that can get you some extra items. The outfits this time around are fantastic, like this medieval-style knight armor. Mickey looks like a typical knight, while Donald just has a barrel and a bowl. The thing is, though, Mickey's armor is so heavy, he sinks in water while Donald is able to float. There's all sorts of minor touches like that here that really make the game feel complete. So if you're going to play any of the three Magical Quest games, the third game is probably the best. 
Since we're talking games that never left Japan, there's also Miki no Tokyo Disneyland Daiboken. This one's a bit of a departure, developed by GRC instead of Capcom, but it's just as brief with only six levels. What makes this one stand out is that Mickey has a tank on his back that fills balloons with either water or helium. Water balloons can be used as projectiles to take out enemies, and helium balloons allow Mickey to float and quickly zip around each level. This game is predicated on exploration more than anything, so you'll be using the helium balloons quite a bit. The controls can be a bit tough to get used to, but this is still a good game worth checking out. Let's go back to North America with Mickey Mania, The Timeless Adventures of Mickey Mouse. This is such a great idea for a game. You play as Mickey visiting some of his past cartoons, starting all the way back with Steamboat Willie and making your way toward more recent settings. The visual design here is inspired, featuring some great sprite animation. The platforming, though, is a bit bland. The game isn't very challenging at all, and the SNES version only has five levels. Plus, there's loading time. Really? Ugh. If you really want to play Mickey Mania, you're better off with the Sega Genesis version. That's got an extra level, no loading time, as well as wider resolution so you can see more of Mickey's world. This is an okay game on SNES, but you're better off with Sega on this one. Next is Mickey's Ultimate Challenge. This is a puzzle game that's clearly intended for a younger audience. I'm talking like eight or younger, and I don't think too many kids that young are watching a video about Super Nintendo games of all things. So I'll just say that this game is okay, it accomplishes what it sets out to do, and it does it better than some of those god-awful educational Mario games. For example, one puzzle has you jumping on books in alphabetical order, another is a simple card matching game, another is like Simon Says. So yeah, Mickey's Ultimate Challenge is clearly intended for kids, so most people watching this aren't going to get much out of it. To wrap up the Mickey Mouse games, there's a game called Mickey's Playtown Adventure, A Day of Discovery. This one was cancelled despite being completely finished, and that's too bad because this features riveting action like Mickey putting away his clothes, picking carrots, and cooking stuff. Again, this one was clearly intended for kids, but if you're looking for a game like that, you're probably better off with Mickey's Ultimate Challenge. Let's move on to another Disney character. Donald Duck had a couple Super Nintendo games, starting with Maui Mallard in Cold Shadow. This one actually originated on the Sega Genesis, so you could argue you're better off playing that version, but this is still a perfectly good game. Rather than settle for just a run-of-the-mill Donald Duck platformer, this game sees Donald playing as two different monikers, the detective Maui Mallard and his alter ego Cold Shadow, who's got crazy ninja skills. Regardless of what platform, the sprite animation here is fantastic and the highlight of the game. However, this is another game that starts out kind of slowly. You only play as Maui Mallard the first level, but after that you can switch between the two characters, and the level design is cleverly done, so you have to use each persona's unique abilities to progress through the game. This is a game well worth checking out. Donald Duck no Maho no Boshi is another Japan-only game for Super Famicom, and again, the sprite animation here is so good. I guess something about Donald brought out the best in artists and animators or something, I don't know. The gameplay here is a bit goofy, however. Each level has a different challenge. First, you're on a bike delivering mail. Next, you're hopping around on a building ledge, washing windows. Then you're retrieving a canary without waking up the guard dog. The idea is that you're working for money to buy Daisy Duck a new hat for her birthday. So yeah, the gameplay is pretty limited, to say the least. But still, I can't help but admire how this game looks. It captures the Disney art style and movement so well, so if you're really into Disney or Donald Duck, then this is a game worth checking out. Alright, next let's just flip through the rest of the games in alphabetical order. These are mostly based on movies or TV shows, starting with Aladdin. This one is in a similar vein to the Magical Quest series in that it's a pretty simple platformer that's very straightforward, not too difficult, and can be completed in one sitting in less than an hour. Go ahead and argue that the Genesis version is better. If that's your opinion, congratulations. The SNES version, though, is still perfectly fine, and Aladdin is a good playthrough featuring great-looking pixel art, varied settings representing unique platforming challenges, forgiving controls, and lots of hidden areas in bonus items to discover. Plus there's no sword. Get out of here with that sword stuff. Next, there's another Super Famicom release that never left Japan, it's Alice No Paint Adventure! And hey, check it out, it's a Mario Paint type game based on Alice in Wonderland. Well, kind of. The paint options are pretty limited, it's pretty much just a coloring book with some really easy mini-games thrown in. It is at least compatible with the SNES mouse. But hey, I can definitively tell you, this is a game that does in fact exist. Beauty and the Beast is yet another side-scrolling platformer, you'll find that to be a recurring theme in this video, and it's made by the same people who made the Judge Dredd and Stargate SNES games. This one is along those same lines. This is a thoroughly okay game, the biggest strength being the visual design and the great looking backgrounds, and the biggest annoyance being how enemies appear out of nowhere so quickly that you barely have a chance to react. You play as the Beast and the game follows the story of the movie just fine, but yeah, this is your average movie-based platformer that's marred by the ridiculous difficulty level. 
Bonkers is a game I did a video on not too long ago. It's based off of the old Disney Afternoon TV show and was made by Capcom. However, it plays a lot like a Konami game, that being Tiny Toon Adventures Buster Bust Loose, because it has the same speed meter that allows you to sprint through stages and take out any enemies and obstacles in your way. There's five levels here with two stages each, and again, this is par for the course for Capcom Disney games. It's short, sweet, and well made, but don't expect too much because you'll finish the game before you know it. Goof Troop is in the same boat as Bonkers. It's based on a Disney Afternoon TV show and developed by Capcom, but this is a top-down action game predicated on solving puzzles to move on to the next area. This is easily one of the best games on this list and one of the best multiplayer games on the Super Nintendo because it has both players working together to open up pathways while taking out enemies. Don't get me wrong though, this game has every bit as good of a single-player experience as well, which just goes to show how cleverly designed Goof Troop is. There's five levels with a boss fight at the end of each and a password system to track your progress, and you use everything around you to get by. Pots, boards, barrels, keys, and tools like shovels and hook shots. If you like simple puzzle solving action games like this, then Goof Troop is a must. It toes the line between a simple straightforward interface with smart puzzle design. Back to the side-scrolling platformers we go with Jungle Book. You play as Mowgli as you climb vines, swing from vines, and climb more vines and swing from more vines. The levels are huge here, with the goal being to collect a certain number of gems, then finding a certain character placed somewhere on the level so you can progress with the story. This is yet another game that looks really good. The sprite animation is impressive, and overall the game accurately captures the spirit of the film. My main nitpick is the controls are pretty slippery and take some getting used to, but this is a perfectly okay game. I'd take it over something like Beauty and the Beast. Next we have The Lion King, and if you remember, I listed this game as one of the toughest on the Super Nintendo. This is one of those games that could be okay, as long as you're okay with spending hours mastering it. Like this section here, where you have to be insanely precise with grabbing onto these hippo tails, or this section here, where you have to arrange the monkeys a certain way so they throw you in the correct direction. I mean, come on, this game is just ridiculous. I can't call it bad, because there are some redeeming qualities here, like the music, and of course, like every other game on this list, it looks fantastic, but the difficulty here is a deal breaker. Pinocchio is yet another side-scrolling platformer, but this game is actually pretty dang good. I know I sound like a broken record saying this, but man, these Disney games have some great sprite animation. Well, I mean, it is Disney, of course the artwork is going to be great. This game has a very similar feel to it as stuff like Lion King and Mickey Mania, but it's not nearly as difficult as Lion King or nearly as bland as Mickey Mania. So this is one I can recommend. It's a very short game, but it's decent enough for a single-player platformer. Timon and Pumbaa's Jungle Games is, of course, based on the two comic relief characters from The Lion King, and this game appears to have been created solely to cash in on their popularity, because all this game is is four mini-games, pinball, a gallery shooter, a frogger ripoff, and a Space Invaders kind of game, where Pumbaa belches at incoming enemies. Each mini-game is fine, I guess, although the gallery shooter stage isn't that good, but yeah, it's just four mini-games, you're better off skipping this one. Finally, we come to Toy Story. This is a pretty impressive title. It manages to capture the unique Toy Story visual style accurately in a 2D environment. I mean, this has kind of a Donkey Kong Country vibe to it. Unfortunately, the controls aren't that great, but there is at least some variety in the gameplay. There's a couple levels where you guide a remote-controlled car. There's a couple racing stages. There are stages that are almost like a one-on-one -on -one fighting game where you have to get Buzz Lightyear to come down from his coke binge, I guess? I mean, jeez, settle down. And there's also a first-person perspective stage where you have to get through a maze, which which is pretty interesting. Toy Story is a really ambitious game, not your generic movie game fodder. The controls for the platforming take some getting used to, but there's a lot here, so it's worth checking out.